Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, of our regular research uh, seminars and talks on a Tuesday evening hosted by the SOAS Middle East Institute and co-hosted by the Center for Palestine Studies and the Center for Iranian Studies. I'm Dina Matar, I'm the chair of the Center for uh, Palestine Studies and I'm also a professor in the uh, law department focusing on uh, media and communication of the Arab world. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to have in our inaugural session for this year, 2021-22, uh, um, uh, Professor Hassan Hakimian, whose contributions to SOAS um, cannot be forgotten. Uh, but he is currently Professor of Economics and he's the Director of the Middle Eastern Institute uh, in Studies Department at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences um, in Qatar at the University of um, uh, ha, ha, uh, HBKU in Qatar. He is also an Emeritus Professor at SOAS where he directed the London Middle East Institute, LMEI, during uh, 2010 to 2019 and was a leader in the economics department. Prior to that, he was associate dean at Cass Business School between 2003 and 2007, and director of the Center for International Education in Economics at SOAS, which was awarded the Queen's Prize for Higher and Further Education in 1996. His research focuses on the economies of the MENA region, specifically labor markets, economic sanctions, inclusive growth, and the economics of Arab uprisings. His most recent publication is an edited collection uh, called the Routledge Handbook on the Middle East uh, Economy, which was published this summer. He is founding member and past president of the International Iranian Economic Association, a research fellow and chair of the advisory committee of this association, and is elected to serve on the Board of Trustees of Economic Research Forum, uh, the largest network of Middle Eastern economists based in Cairo. He is the founder and series editor for the Routledge Political Economy of the Middle East and North Africa, which he launched in 2003. So um, uh, uh, Professor Hakimian is going to talk for about uh, 40 to 45 minutes. He's going to share his screen with us. And then we have questions and uh, answers that I really advise you to put in the Q&A uh, icon, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and send us, uh, send us your questions, and I will collect them to, uh, to put forward to Professor Hakimian at the end of his talk. We also have some people uh, joining us on Facebook, and so they will be, also we will be collecting uh, their um, questions as well. Without further ado, really welcome you, Hassan, to this uh, first talk of the SMEI, and then uh, looking forward to what you have to say, and I'm just going to turn off my microphone, come back later. Thank you so much for agreeing to, um, to be the first speaker in this series. Thank you very much, Tina, for that kind introduction. It really is great <clears throat> to be back at SOAS, well, uh, virtually. <laughs> Um, as you know, <clears throat> I left SOAS after uh, altogether uh, 20 years of service and commitment, although in two stints. Um, and as we always say at SOAS, even when you leave SOAS, you really haven't left it. And I've experienced this at least twice, and this time is no exception. For the past two and uh, two years, just over two years, as you said, I've been at uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University, HBKU, uh, a young and growing university in Qatar, and I'm directing the uh, Middle, East, uh, Middle Eastern Studies Department. This is uh, a new chapter, and uh, the last part of which was affected by COVID, like anybody else's experience. Uh, it felt like being under house arrest, but remarkably, in the last academic session, the full uh, delivery was uh, via online, and our students, we managed to support our students without even seeing them once. I'm sure this is now part of the common global academic uh, story that we experience, all of us. Anyhow, uh, being at the Middle East Institute, uh, and especially being given the pleasure and privilege of inaugurating this year's lectures 
uh, is uh, very close to my heart. Uh, it also brings back memories. Uh, when we were at the lecture theater, uh, I would typically stand up to introduce the speaker. Uh, and then uh, I would go back, sometimes searching for a free seat to occupy. <laughs> and given the level of interest in our activities uh, and events, it was not at all uh, unlikely that actually the lecture theater would be absolutely full and once or twice. I had to scour around to find the seat and, and this was a good sign. Anyway, I hope not to uh, disappoint tonight. I know the loss of old friends, colleagues, uh, and acquaintances in the audience, in the virtual audience. I'm sorry we can't see each other. I'm sorry uh, I'm not uh, in direct contact, but the topic I've spoken, I've chosen to speak to you all is uh, offering critical reflections on Middle East economics. Let me share my screen. I have a, a PowerPoint. Okay, uh, let me let me just adjust. Yeah, I assume you can see my PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I assume that you can also hear me well. But before I start, let me uh, offer my thanks to, uh, as I mentioned, Dina, Chair of the Palestine Studies Center, uh, Nagas Farzad, uh, Chair of Iranian Studies Center, and Aki. Uh, all three of you have uh, been very kind in inviting me and also in supporting the uh, SOAS Middle East Institute activities uh, in the past two years. Um, so special thanks to you for this honor and privilege. Um, this talk draws from a work I've been involved with uh, over four years, the first two years of which coincided with my last two years at SOAS. And then when I joined the uh, Qatar University, HBKU, I completed it here. Um, editing a handbook uh, on one of the world's regional economies such as the Middle East is no small task, task. And without the help and inspiration of many colleagues and friends over the years, it would have been even more daunting. Uh, in fact, the book was just published this summer in July, and it has 22 chapters and covers a wide range of topics of interest. Uh, but I wanna uh, express my thanks from the acknowledgement I have uh, indicated that uh, the inspiration and the commitment to uh, do the book really comes from many generations of my students uh, and colleagues, especially at SOAS, where I was a member of the economics department and also, as Dina mentioned, director of the Middle East Institute. I explicitly state that the intellectual environment of the Department of Economics as well as the wider and vibrant community of Middle Eastern specialists at SOAS were essential for helping me shape my ideas. So I wanted to state that uh, debt, intellectual debt at the outset. Now, the context for this talk tonight, by the way, this talk is not an actual book launch. I will be having a proper book launch for this later in uh, early November, and I will ask Aki to make available the link that would be through my own university, and it will involve a panel of uh, contributors from, from the volume. Uh, the work for this uh, talk draws from uh, the introduction which I wrote for this handbook, and that took me through a retrospective tour of my subject, my discipline, Middle East economics. Now, I appreciate that uh, some uh, in the audience are economists. They uh, may even be uh, very familiar with the uh, contours of Middle East economics. And typically, I know that uh, you know, our audience tend to be interdisciplinary and come from different backgrounds. So I will try and give an overview, which is not too technical, and of course, always happy to discuss uh, anything that comes up in the uh, Q&A section. One of the main motivations behind undertaking to do the handbook was 
I remember when I was teaching the course, and this includes many years uh, at SOAS, the availability of relevant and appropriate reference and teaching materials always was an issue. Although this has been uh, growing over time, but it has been a constraint. So to be able to pull together material which is both up to date and available as a source of reference for newcomers, but, but can also be used as uh, teaching material was something that I thought was uh, capable of filling in the gap. Now, in fact, I will be arguing uh, in the next half an hour or so that Middle East economics is relatively a new subject, in fact. Having said that, of course, it's true that it has come a long way. It has come of age over the past uh, five decades and is now a fairly specialized field within uh, applied economics, applied development economics, political economy of development, area studies, and development studies. So it really sits at the intersection of several disciplines. And that in itself gives it uh, certain distinct features, but also it raises challenges that I will be discussing in this retrospective tour. My main motivation, however, in taking this detour uh, is twofold. As an economist, I've always wondered about the role of socioeconomic and political context on knowledge production in economics. That is both in its theoretical and applied dimensions. I know uh, tradition is that we operate in silos and tradition is that we speak to our members of our own disciplines uh, utilizing um, specialized language. But it has always fascinated me to find out to what extent within economics we are uh, influenced by the context, whether political or socioeconomic. So that is one thing, and I hope to be able to shed light on this. The second one is, I'm also interested to see if the region has actually just been a playground to external ideas that have been imported, or it has also actively contributed to the growth and maturity of the subject, that is development economics theories and policies. So those, let's keep those two motivations in mind, and uh, I will come back to address them. The talk would cover mainly three periods, but I've highlighted here four. The early period, 1950s, 1960s, will be, uh, be brief. Uh, the, the coverage really starts from the so-called oil boom era in the 1970s. Then I go on to discuss the 80s and 90s, the so-called period of growth and uh, jobs crisis very different from the oil boom era. And uh, I will be uh, concluding with some discussion of the so-called Arab Spring, uh, both the period before and after. So the more recent two decades. But let me, let me since I'm covering a very long period, I want to start with a story. Uh, if I were in the company of academic economists, and if I asked, can you identify this picture? I have very little doubt that most people would be able to readily mention Sir William Arthur Lewis's name. Uh, he's, a, he's recognized as a towering figure and one of the four runners in development economics. In fact, he was the first development economist to be awarded the Nobel Prize in economics that was jointly in 1979. And uh, he's very well known amongst economists for his seminal paper, so-called Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor, which was published in 1954. Uh, this text, this article has adorned many reading lists and textbooks uh, for generations of economists and students, of course. You might be wondering, what is the link? And this is where the story. Uh, what is probably less well known about him is that he was actually the first black lecturer to be appointed at LSE, the first black lecturer. That was in 1938. And later on, he was also the first black professor in the UK as a whole. Okay, so those are two unknown or less known facts about him. But probably more significantly, 
his groundbreaking appointment at LSE came with restrictions, which reflected the uh, racial prejudices of the time. He was from the Caribbean island of San Lucia. First, his appointment had to be approved by the LSE's uh, Court of Governors as a special case. And uh, also his total teaching hours were limited. There was not a regular appointment. And this story gets even more interesting. He was only permitted to teach groups of students, which barred him effectively from holding uh, individual tutorials. So I expect he was not considered to be safe. That, that's, that's a measure of the racial uh, undertones of uh, the time. What I'm really interested in, and this is where the link comes in, is that there's a very little known fact, a very obscure fact, uh, that Mena actually features in his seminal paper. In the spring of 1953, Lewis visited Egypt. That's 1953, he visited Egypt, where he was delivering three lectures on industrialization. According to him, the initial idea behind the two-sector model of economic development in his seminal paper came to him a year before in 1952, when he was, I'm quoting, walking down the road in Bangkok, not in Cairo, in Bangkok. But this has nevertheless not deterred some observers to suggest that actually Louis was in many ways, in many ways, the Egyptian lectures, the three Egyptian lectures previewed the main ideas in Louis's 1954 seminal article. Um, after all, Louis had listed Egypt along with India and Jamaica in his paper, where the so-called unlimited supply of labor uh, was obviously the relevant assumption. Now, just as a footnote, the unlimited supply of labor refers to a two-sector model where you have the traditional versus capitalist or agriculture versus industry, uh, where huge portions of workforce and population uh, are operating in the traditional sector at very low productivity levels, to the extent that if you shifted them to the modern or uh, manufacturing sector, their output loss in the traditional sector would be minimal, but this could result in gains in output and productivity in, in the modern sector. So this was very attractive because it essentially pointed to a cost-free path to structural change and transformation. So Egypt was there uh, and he alluded to it. And as I said, he visited. Now this may be a fascinating story, but I'm not by any means suggesting that we can trace the genesis of Middle East economics either to Louis's seminal work or even to this era. In fact, my first argument uh, is that knowledge of Middle Eastern economies as an autonomous field is of relatively recent origins and it has evolved in uneven ways. This is in sharp contrast, for instance, with Latin America, where we have uh, significant contributions. In fact, we can trace the origins of development economics to contributions of Raoul Prabish and uh, uh, establishment of the UN Commission, Economic Commission for Latin America, so-called ECLA, which led to the school, the, the so-called structuralist school. This school focused on uh, so-called unequal exchange and bringing to question the conventional thinking along the lines of comparative advantage, which mainstream economics had always alluded to, meaning that developing countries should uh, specialize in areas where they have apparent comparative advantage, which essentially meant developing countries should concern themselves with exporting raw materials and primary products and agricultural goods. The structural school uh, argued that far from it, uh, there's need for concerted effort by the state to focus on uh, uh, industries. And this led to the so-called import in substitution industrialization or ISI. And later on, it's critique, uh, also the dependence, dependency school. Both the structural school and the dependency school can be traced and have very uh, noticeable roots in Latin America. If you look at South Asia too, here also we have uh, development planning 
going back to the 1950s, although probably in this context, um, influenced by the Soviet planning rather than uh, any other uh, school. And uh, in fact, in South Asia, we've had a tradition of five-year plans that go back to the very first one in 1951 to 56. And the very last one, we have had 12 of them all together, uh, spanned the period 2012 to 17, uh, Prime Minister Modi abolished uh, these plans as of 2014. So let me reiterate the point that to suggest that big ideas in development theory did not originate in the MENA region, our region, does not really mean that they did not reach the region. In fact, in this period, uh, the 1950s and uh, 60s, what I called as the early period, um, we have a number of uh, important and seminal country case studies. We have, for instance, Bahariel on Iran. We have Mabro and Radwan uh, on Egypt, Egyptian industrialization. We have others uh, focusing on specific aspects like agrarian and land reform, the classic work by Lambton. By the way, both Lambton and uh, Radwan were SOAS uh, students. Uh, Lambton also worked at SOAS. Then we also have Warren, Warriner, Doreen Warriner on land reform. And, uh, not to forget the seminal work uh, on economic history of the Middle East uh, by Cook and Isabi, uh, published in early 1970 and uh, much earlier by Isabi, uh, late 40s and early 50s. Uh, before I move on from this early period, it's worth pointing in mind that, point, keeping in mind that in the 50s, 60s was a period of high economic growth. Uh, the region grew at 3.7% per annum, and in fact, its productivity growth, that's output per worker, was the highest in the world. At the same time, we witness uh, significant improvements in social indicators, declining infant mortality, uh, and so on and so forth. Let me now really come to the uh, crux of the matter. Uh, the main boost to the subject comes in the oil boom era. Uh, here we have the formation of OPEC in September 1960, although during the 1960s, OPEC was not particularly uh, influential, but this proved to be a turning point in the contemporary economic history of the region uh, in the way that both its importance in the world energy and financial markets rose after the 1970s, here we have the first oil boom at the end of 1973, when oil prices quadrupled, uh, at the same time as having significant oil bounties, oil income flowing to the region, especially oil exporters, we also begin to see a qualitative shift in the way in which oil companies and oil exporting nations conduct their uh, relations. And here we have a change of ownership from foreign oil companies, that's private companies, uh, to the oil countries themselves. And both these factors catapulted the region into international spotlight. So this is an important turning point. Uh, and as I mentioned, now we have uh, the region uh, experiencing a significant economic, as it were, uh, sea change, uh, as it was now a major recipient of uh, oil windfall. Now, in this period, we see a pioneering work uh, by Hossein Mahdavi, which was published in 1970 uh, on the rentier states. Uh, when it was published, uh, and although it was focused on one of the uh, larger oil states, Iran, uh, this work was not uh, particularly influential at the time. It took a while for it to make its impact. And in fact, over time, it has led to a copious literature that has come to correlate oil rents with poor economic outcomes, i.e. the so-called the curse of uh, oil riches. Uh, some going as far as arguing that uh, oil economies would have been better off not having 
the benefit of oil uh, income. So that's, that's essentially uh, traced to the work of Hussein Mahdavi uh, in his discussion of rentier states. And I quote him here uh, from that early work, the danger that faces the rentier states is that while some of the natural resources of these countries are being fully developed by foreign concerns and considerable government expenditures, usually in few cities, are creating an impression of prosperity and growth. He goes on to say, the mass of population may remain in a backward state and the most important factors for long run growth may receive little or no attention at all. So he was very conscious of the fact that oil income would not necessarily be uh, directed at raising uh, overall uh, welfare and prosperity unless uh, you know, we had a model of resource management that was capable of addressing that. Uh, my second argument tonight is that this groundbreaking work by Hossein Mahdavi actually laid the foundation stone for the emergent so-called resource curse literature. And I would go on further to uh, claim that Perhaps the most influential approach to men economics since the 1970s, and it is arguably one of the few theoretical contributions that seem to have originated in our region and subsequently moved, moved outwards. So this is, this is something that we can, as a region, take credit for it. Uh, and it contrasts with most debates and issues that have been uh, borrowed from and have been from abroad and have been uh, applied to the Middle Eastern context from elsewhere. So that's a, there's a sharp contrast uh, in this period. Let me now go on to the next two decades. If the 1970s was a period of oil boom and oil prosperity, uh, changing the economic calculus for the region as a whole, the contrast couldn't be sharper with the 1980s and 1990s. This is a period which is better known for its growth and job crisis. This uh, affected both oil exporting countries and non-oil exporting eco economies. Um, this period, in this period, effectively the region's uh, fortunes began to take a turn for the worse. Uh, we had, first of all, the significant uh, oil price crash of the 1980s, in 1986 to be precise. And we had also open discord and disunity within OPEC. Let's remember that two OPEC members, Iran and Iraq, were openly at war with each other during most of the 1980s. Uh, so this really uh, contributed to the oil bounty drawing off. And with it also the oil remittances that uh, were finding their way to non-oil exporting countries of the region. Uh, so we had a picture of deteriorating public finances, rising debt, shrinking public investment, and these were common experiences. Very sharp contrast with the situation in the 1970s. Now, reflecting the uh, harsh conditions of these two decades, GDP growth sank to 1% per annum. And if you take into account uh, high population growth rates in this period, uh, for the 1980s at least, we have negative per capita population growth. So this is this era, 1980s, especially in the Middle East, is known as the lost decade. Uh, we had also double digit national rates of unemployment, particularly high unemployment rates, both at the national level, but particularly amongst uh, youth. The youth bulge, as I mentioned, high population growth contributed to this and lack of success in job creation. So it was a twin, uh, or double crisis, both affecting growth and job creation. Uh, and as I said, uh, the scene economic landscape changed radically from boom to bust. Um, and uh, this course now within Middle East economics shifted from explaining the consequences or opportunities opened up by oil, oil boom to uh, explaining inferior economic outcome outcome and the growth crisis. So, so there's a rather significant change. What is very interesting in this period is that also we see 
Uh, the rising influence of the so-called international financial institutions and donor agencies, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, uh, get a stronger foothold uh, in the region and particularly those countries which are struggling for economic uh, stabilization and growth. These are led, for instance, by Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan, and Egypt. And the so-called SAPs, structural adjustment programs, of course, come with conditions. Uh, austerity programs introduced uh, with very harsh social outcomes. Uh, this is the period in which, not just in the Middle East, but also in the Middle East, the so-called Washington Consensus. Washington Consensus in econ economics reflects to the three institutions, all three of which were in Washington or are in Washington, the Treasury, the US Treasury, the World Bank, and the IMF, uh, pushing, advocating market-friendly economic reforms, which uh, had two twin, uh, had, which had twin uh, strategies. At home, domestically, they pushed for economic liberalization and privatization. And internationally, they pushed for uh, open access to markets, both in terms of international trade and investment. In this period, one could argue, despite the crisis or perhaps because of the crisis, actually Middle East economics is now in full swing and is addressing a much wider set of topics beyond oil. And in the same period, we see a significant rise in intellectual output and publications, and also the expansion of research capacity in the region. Part of this is explained by investment by international financial institutions in various capacity building programs, uh, training programs, but also uh, a growing number of uh, PhD graduates from the region, uh, mainly uh, doing their PhDs in Middle East, different aspects of Middle East economics, uh, in uh, US universities and, and in European uh, countries. Let me now come to the third and last period that I intend to cover. And that is uh, what is widely known as the Arab Spring, although this was a very short period in terms of the expectations uh, that were unmet. Um, now, this period also, contrasts with the previous two periods significantly in the fact that the tumultuous uprisings and political unrest that swept across the Arab world largely came as a shock. Uh, many observers, uh, including economists, especially mainstream economists, uh, were taken aback. And uh, one could argue that the uh, upheavals came at a time when they were least expected. Why is that? Because if you actually look at mainstream macro fundamentals, economic indicators, the first decade of the 21st century, unlike the 80s and 90s, actually indicates comparatively better economic growth record in the region. Growth is now up from 1%, as I mentioned before, reaching around average 4 to 4.5% uh, for the region at large. Some countries experiencing higher, some lower. But comparatively speaking, over, line, over time, the trend line shows an improvement. Um, and and uh, even if you look at beyond growth rates, uh, poverty, which is not, uh, comparatively speaking, very high in the region, was on the decline. Uh, I emphasize the comparative uh, basis, I'm not saying that poverty is absent from the region. Uh, and uh, even some indications that inequality in some of the countries, at least measured by uh, conventional criteria, was on the down uh, trend line. Uh, so probably it's not surprising that uh, some of the international financial institutions were basking in the glory of the fact that some of the policies they had advocated in the 80s, 90s were now being um, uh, implemented by the Arab autocrats, and they were too quick to claim uh, credit for them, going as far as even um, uh, lauding them for the apparently positive outcomes. Uh, there is an interesting uh, publication by Anktad in November 2010, that's just literally a month before the Tunis uh, uprising, the first uprising in the Arab world which speaks of uh, Tunisia 
uh, as uh, as the Norway of uh, North Africa. So you can imagine that uh, these developments uh, led to some blushing and uh, proved to be rather um, uh, embarrassing for some mainstream uh, analysts. Uh, the main conundrum was that, as I mentioned, many countries were experiencing improvements in relative prosperity, not economic downturns or stagnation in the period before the Arab Spring. And by this period, I mean roughly 2000 to 2010. So that's the first decade of the 21st century. Now, this is interesting because it seems to go against conventional thinking that generally links mass revolts to economic hardship, to social degeneration, contending that periods of relative prosperity are correlated with mass political quiescence. Uh, and, and, and in fact, this period actually questions fundamentally this simple, if not simplistic, one-to-one uh, -one and linear perception that uh, uprisings and political unrest come only as a result of hardship and uh, stagnation, uh, recession, unemployment, inequality. Uh, the, the period uh, before, as I mentioned, was anything but that. In fact, for that, you need really to dig back to the 80s, 90s. Uh, and I would argue further that this was not the first time we see this conundrum. In fact, if you think back at the, to the Iranian revolution in 1979, that also came after several years of uh, unprecedented uh, rise in oil income. Iran actually experienced you know, unprecedented oil boom in the 70s and hence, and yet we had the uh, mass revolution in 1979. So I would argue that even in that respect, the Arab uprisings probably followed a similar uh, trend. If you look at oil prices in the uh, decade before the Arab Spring, 2002 to 2008, that's most of that decade, oil prices uh, are on an almost one way upward street, uh, reaching an all time high in July 19, 2008 of about just under $150. So, so this is anything but a period of stagnation and uh, recession. So I, I, I mentioned this because I think that this conundrum in itself uh, has led to soul searching. It has come as an anomaly, uh, challenging uh, a lot of, especially mainstream economists. And uh, it has sent a lot of uh, us looking at the root causes and also consequences of these developments. Uh, this was now an important challenge. Now in highlighting better than uh, expected economic performance in the region in that 10 year period, I'm not overlooking the fragilities. And I just want to look at two aspects. One is the age composition and another one is unemployment rates before I quickly move on. If you look at this, as we know, the Middle East region is a very young region. If you look at the median age of population in a number of uh, countries, for example, median age is uh, the 50% cutoff point. So 50% of the population is below the median age and another 50% exactly the same share above it. In Tunisia and Egypt, which experienced the Arab uprisings first, uh, the median age is upper 20s. Uh, Yemen is a very, very young country. These figures are, by, by the way, by 2010, for 2010. Yemen, in Yemen, 7, 15, sorry, 50 percent of the population uh, were born in the previous 17 years only. And in the West Bank and Gaza, that's only 20 years. If you want to put, put this in context, compare this with, say, European countries uh, or uh, the USA, you're typically looking at median ages of upper 30s, lower 40s. Uh, Japan has a very high median age of 48 years, so the age composition is very different. Anyhow, so this is a very young uh, structure of population, which is probably why the youth played an important part in the uprisings. But more, more importantly, perhaps, the limitations I mentioned in terms of job creation and um, uh, the growth in the number of uh, those with jobs I've highlighted here both national unemployment rates in dark, in yellow, in, in, in light blue and 
In dark blue, you have youth unemployment. And you can see, for instance, uh, in West Bank and Gaza, youth unemployment is 40%. In Iraq, it was about 40%. In Saudi Arabia, in the middle, almost 30%. In fact, uh, the Middle East and North Africa, as many of us know, has uh, the, some of the highest uh, youth unemployment rates in the world, uh, and typically uh, almost all double digit. So, so this is the sort of fragility that despite growth, we uh, continue to envisage. I mentioned the anomalies uh, relating to the Arab uprisings led to a degree of soul searching in various fields. Uh, economics was not, Middle East economics was no exception. Uh, it led to questions uh, relating to, for instance, were we not looking, were we remiss at the wider, more important undercurrents? Or maybe we were looking, but looking through the long, wrong lenses or our glasses were uh, tarnished. Uh, that is, maybe we were looking at the wrong indicators. We should be changing focus. Or alternatively, maybe we had uh, the right data, we were looking at the right indicators, but it was our weak deductive powers that let us down. Uh, and that is where I mentioned the association between economic conditions and political upheavals. Maybe we need to rethink about that. Um, at any rate, we can't also rule out the possibility that the uprisings were mainly of a political rather than economic character for us. You know, th there's no reason why all uprisings have an economic root uh, as such. And it is probably fair to suggest that the so-called Arab Spring had as many lessons for economists and for political scientists, but since my focus on Middle East economics, I'm obviously naturally interested in uh, exploring uh, the impact of these developments. And by way of its legacy, uh, what is interesting, I mean, both quantitative and qualitative transformations of the subject actually take place when we seem least able to understand phenomena. As Danny Rodrick once said, uh, anomalies are good for social sciences. If you are operating in our comfort zone, we are less likely to be curious. And when we are confronted with anomalies, we are more likely to uh, search for answers. And, and I think this period has been in this respect also quite uh, productive. Uh, at the quantitative level, uh, Middle East economics has received a boost. We see greater uh, interest in research, uh, which has uh, resulted in a greater volume of publications, greater attention to output, uh, seminars, workshops, and so on. But perhaps even more importantly, it has widened, it has helped, it has contributed to widening the scope and coverage of the political economy of Ghana. Uh, whereas before we were more likely to be operating within uh, silos, I think these uh, tumultuous developments reminded us of the importance of uh, opening up our perspectives and engaging with other uh, questions and problems uh, from other disciplines. Uh, I would make a third remark, and that is, it is probably fair to suggest that uh, among economists now, there is arguably greater and more explicit recognition of the importance of political and social factors. Now, how long this may continue, I don't know. It may be that we go back to our own uh, old habits. Uh, the young generation within the economics discipline is under pressure to publish uh, or perish or risk perishing. Uh, publications uh, within mainstream economics require dealing with uh, large data sets and do not always look favorably, uh, five-star journals do not look favorably on uh, interdisciplinary research. So it may be that this is a window of opportunity which may not last for long and it may close uh, before long. But I think uh, one positive outcome of this period even if limited to a limited extent, has been this wider and richer scope and diversity of the topics, some of which I have um, listed here. So economists within Middle East economics now much more readily 
engage with topics such as poverty and inequality, human development, the role of religion and Islam in development, uh, chronic capitalism, governance and transition to democracy, gender, of course, and impacts of conflict and forced displacements or refugees. None of these topics are new. I'm not saying that uh, they can only and exclusively be um, traced to the Arab Spring years, but Arab Spring and the uprisings have given them a degree of poignancy, uh, which uh, in our uh, region uh, cannot be missed. Uh, to wrap up this particular section, uh, I want to ask the question that I alluded to, did economic factors matter in the Arab context? I don't myself uh, subscribe to the view that it was only economic factors, although economics was a context, and we would need to understand economic factors in order to uh, shed light on these developments, uh, which were essentially driven by, in my view, aspirations if not frustrations of the urban educated middle classes, youth included, of course, for greater freedom and better governance and respect of uh, too long suffering from corruption, from crony capitalism, and uh, of course, uh, blatant dictatorship and lack of respect for freedom and human rights. Okay, um, I'm coming up to the end of my presentation. Uh, let me offer some Concluding remarks. So where does the subject stand and where do we, uh, how can we reflect on its, I, what I call the bumpy road coming of age over the last 50 years? Uh, I would say the subject has been much enriched by developments in the region, some of which I explained through different periods with sharp contrasts from one to another. It is now recognizable as a field, but Middle East economics somehow uncomfortably sits between two disciplines, broad disciplines. One is area studies on one hand, and another is mainstream economics. Now, sitting at the intersection or on the boundaries of two disciplines can help enrich the subject, but it also poses uh, uh, challenges. Within area studies, the main challenge is Middle East economics has to try and avoid the pitfalls of exceptionalism, especially given the disappointments and the failures of the Arab Spring. There is a possibility uh, of Arab exceptionalism coming back, and that, that is something that generally Middle East studies at large, but Middle East economics being no exception, have to be um, concerned with. If you look at economics, especially mainstream economics, we also have to avoid the limitations of getting mired, if not bogged down, with growing um, in growing mathematical finesse and sophisticated model building. This is, to a large extent, uh, the story of modern day economics discipline uh, in mainstream uh, academic departments the emphasis on quantitative formal testing, model building is phenomenal. And, uh, and of course, Middle East economics uh, will not be immune, has not been immune from it. Uh, but that is where also we risk losing perspective of some of the most fundamental and important uh, problems and challenges of our region. I wanna end by quoting uh, Danny Rodrick, a famous economist uh, at uh, MIT of uh, Turkish origins. He once observed, we use maths in economics, not because we are smart, but because we are not smart enough. In other words, there's another way of saying the same thing without being too impressive utilizing mathematics. Maths has its own place in economics. Uh, it's a useful language, but it should not come at the expense of replacing our encounter with serious and fundamental challenges which our region has faced in the last 50 years and will continue to face, no doubt. Happily, the region can boast a lot of talent, not just natural resources, but also a lot of talent and economics is no exception to this. So let me end there. I think I've managed to stay within the time boundary that Dina set me, 46 minutes. So. 
if you permit me, I will now stop sharing uh, so that we can move to. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Hassan, to a really, uh, really impressive broad sweep uh, of the uh, of of the economics and the field of the Middle East. Um, I, I might have some question later on, but I'm going to go to questions in the audience. Please remember that you have to put your question in the Q and A chat because I know someone has raised their hand, but we cannot take a raised hand uh, because we can't see you or we can't offer you the platform. Um, I think the first one, we have just three questions, but we'll go through them. I, I don't think the first one is a question. It says, someone has said, that to undermine a state is to undermine its currency. So with the astronomical devaluation of the respective national currency versus the US dollar, are each of Iraq, neighboring Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and Libya fragile, failing, or failed states? Um, what about UN involvement? And apparently the solution is to, um, is to avert it. So, I, but I think that the question here is, uh, whether whether we can relate um, economics widely or understanding of the economics in the region to uh, to the currency or to how the currency uh, can be devalued against the dollar and of course this raises much bigger questions so I don't know whether you you can I can, I can address that briefly I mean obviously this is a very big question uh, and. Uh... Uh, I don't want to pretend I have an answer. Uh, I don't think all these countries listed here, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and Libya are all failed states. Certainly Iran is not yet. Uh, I hope it won't be because that's, uh, that would be calamitous for the region. Uh, however, sadly, we have witnessed far too many failed states in the region for our liking, uh, especially after the Arab uprisings. Uh, Lebanon, which has always been known to be characterized by a weak state for very different reasons than for Yemen or Libya or even Syria, uh, unfortunately seems to be heading that way. This, this, uh, the question of the currency, uh, currency is in a sense the symptom of the wider malaise. And, and here I know uh, it is all too tempting to blame uh, failures within uh, the economy uh, uh, to external uh, intervention uh, factors of the sort. And of course, these are very, very important. I mean, I, some of my own personal work has focused on the cruelty of economic sanctions in the region, uh, of which our region on, knows only too well. I mean, you look at uh, Gaza, you know, this is, this is <laughs> an economy under siege, the textbook definition of blockade and sanctions is Gaza. Iran has uh, been experiencing uh, some of the toughest sanctions, uh, not by my description, by the descriptions, description of those who have imposed it. They take pride in the fact that these are some of the san toughest sanctions in, in history. Um, even uh, Joe Biden, Vice President Joe Biden in two, his 2010, uh, debate. He took, uh, this is at the time of Obama, he took credit for having imposed, his administration having imposed some of the toughest sanctions on Iran. So yes, sanctions and external factors, I mean, the case of Iraq, of course, the 2003 intervention, there's a whole host of uh, external influences uh, that have had a deleterious impact on the economies of the region, uh, Libya, uh, Syria and so on and so forth. But this is not to lessen the Im importance of uh, proper uh, and competent economic uh, management either. A lot of Iran's economic problems uh, are also to do with econo economic mismanagement. And, and this is very difficult to disentangle the one from the other. Um, for this, we might just look at uh, an, a natural experiment in 2016, when the so-called JCPOA, uh, the nuclear deal with the US was signed, 
And some of, and I emphasize at least some of those sanctions, not all of them by any means, were uh, abolished. The Iranian economy took off. In 2016, it grew by 12.5%. Now, a lot of this was to do with the fact that the oil sector uh, regained its pre-sanctions uh, importance in the economy, but it did show the potential for growth, domestic growth, if these sanctions were not in place. So uh, the same with Lebanon. I mean, you know, Lebanon, Leb Lebanese currency has uh, collapsed. We could blame this on external forces and intervention in Lebanese economy and the sectarian divide and how uh, this has been uh, really uh, nefarious, has had nefarious impact on the Lebanese economy. But, but you know, one cannot um, uh, underrate the importance of economic mismanagement. The classic case is Greece. When Greece experienced its Euro crisis, you would remember that this was at the back of the fact that there were fraudulent national statistics being published year after year after year because the statistical agency in Greece was basically at the service of the government. And they published data that pleased the European Union. And it was not until after the crisis when Greece took steps to establish an independent statistical agency that had no fear of telling the economic uh, story as it was, that you know uh, the problems could be could be addressed. So it's a very complicated combination of both internal and external factors. And if anybody claims they have the a clear formula that enables them to disentangle the domestic from the external, uh, I, I I would caution against that. Uh, thank you. For a few questions coming through. Uh, one by uh, Merit Jacob saying, looking ahead and considering the lessons of the Arab uprisings, what would you expect to happen to the rent economies of the Middle East, uh, considering the global ecological transformation? How can these uh, economies based mostly on rent try to adapt to this change? It's a big question, I guess. Yeah, the, yes, but this is a critical question that with or without Arab uprisings, uh, the oil exporters would have to address. As we speak, uh, the uh, oil exporters are uh, benefiting from a rebound in oil prices, oil and gas prices, actually. Well, gas has been uh, in the news, uh, I'm sure as consumers in the UK and in Europe, you hear a lot about uh, the significant surge in uh, gas prices. It may appear, looking at it from the side of the exporters, that the worst is over. No, I think I think all these uh, all these fluctuations in energy prices, uh, the ups and downs, and let's not forget that uh, during the COVID, in the last year or so, we had a significant uh, crash in oil prices. Uh, it's a reminder of the need to think long term and to aim to diversify economies. Uh, everybody knows uh, that you know there is a significant risk. To economic strategies continuing to rely on uh, oil riches, energy riches in the long term. The risk is that uh, with alternative technology, with uh, growing importance of renewable technology, which is already happening, with electrification of transport, which is already happening, uh, with uh, growing government commitment to ceasing uh, CO2 uh, generated uh, fueled cars and so on, uh, there's every possibility that uh, oil exporting countries may end up with a lot of what is now known as stranded assets under the ground. Mm -hmm. This is, by, by the way, partly why the UAE uh, had a spat with Saudi Arabia uh, back a few months ago, because it wanted to increase its oil quota, taking advantage of the fact that you make a run for it while you can, i.e. if there is, if demand for oil is now uh, going up, and if they are concerned about inability in the long term, ending up with unsold oil, this is the time to expand output and sell and export more. So this consideration is serious. 
some of the smaller Gulf states like Qatar, where I am now, uh, have made a, a deliberate uh, uh, and, and significant investments into diversifying in niche areas like culture, like sports, um, museums, and so on. Whether this will be sustainable into the long term remains to be seen, but the effort is there, the awareness is there, and I don't think uh, uh, whether with or without Arab uprisings, uh, the, the argument that you can continue to rely on oil and energy resources in the long term would hold water. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And there's a, there's a question or a comment about a uh, possible role of displaced diasporic men as scholars in the growth of many economic research. Um, but, you know, probably we can answer that later. Uh, but. Yeah. I would like to ask a question from Kais Hamza. Is there a meaningful economic progress without unleashing the ability of social for forces to express and organize itself to gain a piece of the cake? So does this in turn necessitate certain political freedoms and rights to organize, hence some democratic norms and accountability from governments? So the question is uh, really is about politics and economics going hand in hand, presumably, um, and whether you could comment on this. Yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is an old puzzle, uh, and it surfaces in the literature and in the debates in different ways. Uh, empirically in economics, there have been some studies to try and establish whether more democratic uh, economies perform better economically, to so to speak, or not. And, and really the, the evidence is mixed. You have on one hand, uh, strong states, the so-called developmental states. You have the example of, of course, China, which is the prominent example where uh, political liberaliz liberalization uh, is, has taken a secondary role to economic liberalization. So the evidence uh, is mixed. Uh, but I think where I would agree with the questioner with Kais is the importance in the long term of making sure that economic growth benefits larger sections of the population. Uh, it's not just to secure better outcomes, but to secure sustainability. I think if there is one overriding lesson from the Arab uprisings is that the period I referred to, uh, the 10 years or the decade before the Arab uprisings, Relatively speaking, economic growth record was decent. Growth rates at four to four and a half percent were achieved. In fact, uh, Libya was uh, recording growth rates at around seven percent. Uh, Tunis and Tunisia and uh, Egypt, likewise, you know, they had a decent economic record. What was important was, however, the type of economic record, the type of economic outcome, and you know, if you have growth, which is concentrated at the top end of the population, which is contributing to greater alienation, growing uh, inequality, even if in relative terms or perceptions of inequality, uh, what I refer to as crony capitalism, if growth takes place through engines, which are uh, the preserves and cronies of the ruling state, mm. you can be sure that, you know, sometime or other, political developments will catch up with the economy. Yeah. And I think that was one important overriding example. Another part of my own personal uh, research in the last few years has focused precisely what we now refer to as inclusive growth. Uh, the importance of growth that is inclusive, that uh, benefits wider sections of the population and it is not limited or constrained to certain and limited segments only. I think this is, this is an important challenge. Uh, the, in the Chinese context, if you put aside governance and political developments or lack of them to one side, even economic uh, record speaks of an uneven uh, record of achievements. You have very impressive growth rates over decades, reaching uh, on average around 9%. Now it's lower, it's around 6% uh, or so, and is looking a little bit fragile for reasons that... Uh, have to do with uh, energy supplies and also the need for increasing the uh, share of renewable energies in the energy mix. But, but that record 
has been even more impressive in terms of China's ability to reduce poverty, at least headcount extreme poverty, the share of the population, the number of population falling below $1.90 or as it used to be $1.25 in the past. Several hundred million uh, people have been pushed above this threshold, uh, which is an achievement. Um, but nevertheless, inequality has been growing. Inequality both in spatial terms between the East Coast and the Western uh, uh, mainland, or between rural and urban areas and between different income groups. Now it's no secret that in China you have the largest concentration of billionaires or millionaires. So yes, I agree with the spirit of the question. Uh, meaningful economic progress would require uh, unleashing social and political forces, especially looked at from a long-term perspective. That's, that's an important lesson from the Arab uprising. Thank you. Uh, there are uh, qu uh, two points by Karen uh, Rev, and she says that, well, thank you for the great le lecture. So that, that is wonderful to hear. Uh, there's a question about, hasn't the resource curse theory rentier state, et cetera, being debunked. Don't the results depend on what policy structures and social and class formations are in place? And, and in relation to this, despite the relative growth that you alluded to before the Arab Spring, isn't income and wealth inequality in the Middle East some of the highest in the world? Um, so these are two related questions. Yeah, these are, yeah. Uh, the resource curse, has it been debunked? Well, <laughs> depends on the perspective. There are people who still believe in resource scarce and there are people who never believed in resource scarce, I myself being one. And there are people who might have believed in resource scarce but now don't believe in it anymore. Um, so, you know, old approaches, uh, ideologies don't uh, dry out. They come back in different forms and in different guises. Uh, and yes, I, I fully agree uh, that the so-called resource curse is on weak ground if it is seen as an eternal destiny, i.e. that equates natural riches and income from uh, booms associated with those natural riches exports with poor outcomes. You're doomed if you're rich. The, if you turn this equation around, the other side of the coin is glory, there's glory in poverty. I'm sorry, I personally speaking, I don't, I don't bite that uh, story. Uh, which one would you prefer to be? Would you prefer to have the riches that you need to manage properly or you prefer to have poverty that uh, is supposed to bring uh, satisfaction and welfare? I, there are different, I mean, to be fair to resource curse, there are different strands, there are different versions. And, and I mentioned very clearly the rentier state, which is a political economy approach. This one really focuses on the implications of the concentration of significant amounts of resources, typically within uh, you know, the government sector, because oil, oil income accrues to the government. The government is therefore uh, independent or has certain degree of significant degree of relative autonomy from social classes because it does not need to raise income through taxes. So it's less accountable. That's number one. Number two, you could also argue, and people have certainly argued that the fact that the region is rich in natural resources has always contributed to external interest, hence external interest in the region, hence these conflicts. I remember very clearly there was uh, intense debate when the US invasion of Iraq took place in 2003, March 2003, that a lot of people attributed that to the ever insatiable uh, appetite or thirst for the US economy to secure affordable long-term uh, and sustainable supplies of oil. Well, that is one perspective. What but what when what but when you look at what happened the oil prices after 2003 2003 uh, period uh, I mentioned earlier to 2008 they kept going up if that was the intention or the strategic uh, aspiration of the U.S. to secure oil supplies it 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 failed miserably so yes there are aspects of rentier state whether focusing on domestic factors or uh, external that are enlightening, they are important, we should engage with them. 
But this simplistic argument that you know riches bring uh, misery, and uh, rather polemically, as I put it, poverty brings glory. I think that's probably the easier version to 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 debunk or dismiss. The second question, uh, despite the relative growth, isn't income and wealth inequality? Yeah, you know, uh, I can refer you. Inequality in the region is actually one of the topics uh, the, the book I mentioned uh, covers. Uh, again, there are different perspectives on this. Uh, if you look at uh, standard conventional criteria for measuring inequality, in the works of the World Bank and so on. Uh, in fact, a country like Egypt was showing declining inequality. Uh, the so-called Gini coefficient was in the sort of mid thirties. If you look at South Africa, Brazil, they're systematically above 50. They're way, way over, way over. Um, so I think by on those comparative grounds, if you compare like with like, i.e. Um, conventional criteria such as Gini coefficient, the region is not best known for its uh, high inequality. But th there are people who have questioned the methodology, uh, typically pointing out that the top 20% or the top 10% in these income surveys are either missed systematically or understate their income. So there are a lot of grounds for uh, suspecting the 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 uh, you know, accuracy or precision of these data. And I think it's a healthy thing to maintain those. Uh, yeah. And there are two questions related to oil. One of them I will, I will read, but the first one is by Frederick Becker saying, how do you see the economic situation when the oil reserves will have finished? Which impact could it have on the societies of the Arab, uh, Arab world? Big question. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, yeah. I... I'm really not here to predict the future, uh, you know, with or without oil. And of course, it's worth remembering that we have both types of these economies in the MENA region. Not all economies are oil exporters. Um, with or without oil, they have challenges. They have to address them. Um, so if you don't have oil, the situation will be even more challenging, as we have seen periodically when oil prices crash. Mm. It's very hard to uh, fathom the fact that when we had the oil price boom in the 70s, they crashed to below $10 a barrel by 1986. And this is a, an ongoing story. Uh, you know, we've had, uh, after the global financial crisis in 2008, when I mentioned oil prices reached an all-time high of just under $150, July 2008, by January 2009, that's less than a year, Oil prices had plummeted to $39 for a short period, but nevertheless, what goes up can come down and what goes down can come back up. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there are economists to point out to these excessive fluctuations as being unsettling and being a major challenge. So it's not just having the oil uh, income, but dealing with the fluctuations. And now there are, of course, uh, policies uh, uh, addressing those fluctuations, namely uh, setting up uh, sovereign wealth funds and uh, uh, foreign currency reserves within the central banks to smooth out the fiscal impact of fluctuating oil income. It's a challenge with or without, but I think long-term speaking, it goes back to the earlier question. There's no doubt that there's no doubt that diversification and attempting to diversify is the way forward. Mm. And this comes to the question by Ukran, where it says, do you see any potential success in the effort uh, for diversification through global investment, as well as through some non-oil regional investment? Or is it a Middle East with less and less economic assets, more likely as oil diminishes? So uh, yeah, and what about the wider regional effect considering the remittances uh, of the economy? So it's you know, around the same topic. Uh, we, are, we are hovering around uh, fascination with oil, <laughs> which is understandable. Um, I mean, there are people uh, who question whether uh, countries like, for instance, Dubai or even Qatar have not uh, escaped the so-called oil curse. Both have, to a significant extent, tried to diversify. 
Qatar is now more gas exporting dependent than oil. That is probably why it left OPEC in 2018. Uh, and it has uh, made uh, a huge effort to diversify its economy. It's a small economy. The local population is only 10% of the total. That's about uh, just under 300,000 out of less than 3 million. To what extent you can generalize on the basis of what is essentially a city state for the larger, more complex uh, and more complicated economies like Jordan, Egypt, uh, Libya, Iran, Algeria, Lebanon, and so on, that, that remains to be seen. Uh, so uh, I think Dubai also itself, uh, you know, Dubai itself has made important strides in this field uh, and, and, and maybe uh, following Singapore as a role model uh, has been the main uh, uh, model that uh, Dubai has followed so far to a large extent successfully. Um, so yes, but looking at outside the region, uh, the clear case is Norway. Uh, Norway is an oil economy as well, although an industrialized one, uh, one which is developed. Uh, its oil industry is managed in a very, very different way than uh, Middle Eastern economies. As you know, uh, all oil income is invested wholly in uh, a sovereign wealth fund, uh, which I think is probably the largest in the world, and which is devoted exclusively to maintaining welfare and well being of future generations. So it is not spent on current consumption by any means. Mm. Uh, it is true that you know, Norway benefited from oil income after it had developed industries and it had industrialized. So the elements of diversification and industrialization were already there. But there are very interesting examples that um, our, our region can draw from. Uh, there are also then the East Asian economies. I saw one of the questions touched on this, the so-called Asian tigers. I mean, here you have not so much focus on natural riches, but the vision and the commitment of a central developmental state that has mobilized resources around uh, a long-term vision of growth and structural transformation. One could argue that Iran pre-revolution uh, fitted into that framework. Let's not forget that Iran between 1960 and 79 for a good part of two decades, although it was an oil economy, it was growing at 9% uh, in real terms per annum. And this occurred not just because of growing contribution of oil, um, but because of a big push for industrialization following the so-called import substitution model, and uh, one which uh, resulted in uh, you know, a significant degree of uh, uh, diversification. Mm. Um, all this talk about OPEC and so on. I, 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 used, to, I used to cover OPEC summits and <laughs> meetings. So, so very, very uh, uh, knowledgeable of the, you know, the, the, the machine, the political machining, machinations behind it. But I have, I have a quick question to you because I was really, I want to go back to the critical reflections. I know there's a question about US sanctions and so on, but I wonder, you know, whether you could elaborate a bit further on um, the fact that economists were not looking in the right place uh, when the Arab uprisings happened or before the Arab uprisings and whether, what, you know, how that has affected, uh, let us say, the, the, the grand theorization in, in mainstream uh, econ uh, economics, or has it not? You know, in a sense, because in other disciplines, there's been this kind of revisionist thinking around, um, okay, where are we looking in the wrong place in, re in relation to kind of these uh, ruptures? So perhaps you could talk about that very briefly, uh, but there is another question coming up um, around the current U.S. sanctions re re uh, regime, how important are these in terms of development growth of the economies of the MENA? And you have about five minutes. 
<laughs> well, these two. Well, uh, uh, your question, uh, lessons from the Arab uprisings and the likely lasting long-term impact on the discipline, I'm not so uh, optimistic. I think uh, we are humans. We are impacted by short-term uh, swings and long-term trends. Uh, we also have short memory. Uh, we forget, we tend to forget things. Uh, memory of Arab Spring is already a distant memory, I'm sorry to say. I remember very exciting moments when at SOAS, uh, not least in these very same seminars, we were debating uh, new possibilities, a new dawn perhaps, that the Arab Spring, the Arab uprisings may have opened up. I actually wrote a very short piece on the economics of the Arab uprisings, which I subtitled as a bumpy road ahead. And uh, I, I highlighted, I'm not usually a pessimistic person by any means or chance, but I highlighted two main challenges despite this euphoria, which, was, which I shared, of course, myself, very exciting times. One of which was the massive explosion in popular demands. You know, it's a misfortune to happen to be in an administration that has to deliver everything for everybody yesterday. Given the revolutionary zeal with which you know people endanger their lives, they make demands, they are entitled to a better system of delivery, of course. But it's much more difficult to actually deliver those, even a fraction of those expectations. Even if we had relative political stability, even if we had sustainable governments, which in most cases we didn't, even or especially in Egypt. Uh, nevertheless, any incoming administration, even if it had the competency to deal with challenging economic situations, that very factor of dealing with um, explosion in popular demands and expectations would, would and, and the populist pressure to distribute first and then think about growth. I mean, I, throughout this talk, maybe I've sounded a little bit too critical of growth record, but you can't, you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. The question is to have growth and maintain growth and make sure growth is inclusive. If you underrate growth, well, you're back to recession, you're back to unemployment, you are back to global financial crisis. So, you know, you cannot dismiss growth. Uh, you have to make sure it's the right type of growth. And, and hence, um, I think, as I said earlier, the one lasting lesson from the Arab uprisings I hope would be the relative importance of uh, the need to make sure growth is inclusive, not ex exclusive. Well, thank you, Hajar. Yeah. Sanctions is a big topic. I can offer to talk another session uh, for another seminar. This is something which is uh, very close to my research interest. In fact, in the Middle East Institute in the past, I have uh, spoken on this topic, but really to do it justice, uh, you know, we need more time. Thank you so much, and apologies to Fanny, but we, we can answer that in another uh, in another uh, session. So we have to get you back, Hassan, to talk. Uh, but maybe we can have uh, the book launch, and uh, uh, we can we can be part of that as well. Uh, but I I want to thank you for a very interesting talk. I learned a lot myself, and I'm sure that uh, our audience did as well. Thank you so much for your questions. And thank you to Aki for hosting this and supporting us and the SOAS Middle East Institute. And look forward to uh, seeing you again. And um, please keep an eye out for all our events uh, on our website. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Have a good evening. And you too. Good, good evening. Bye-bye.